entrepreneur, jet pilot, peak performance coach, and best-selling author brings you Living Outside the Cube, where great thinkers and doers of our century talk about how to help you be your best. Here is your host, Fabrizio Poli. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Living Outside the Cube. Today, we're in contact with Arizona over in the United States, and uh, we have Dennis Deaton with us, or should I say Dr. Dennis Deaton. Uh, Dennis is a, a, f- a famous author. He's written the book of Mind Management and also the Ownership Spirit and Money and Owner's Manual. He started his career as a dentist to then become a personal development trainer and touches many people's lives through his courses throughout the world. Dennis, thank you for being on the show. It's great to be with you. Wish I was in England. You know, <laughs> In, in, right now, it's August in Arizona. We only have two. We only have two seasons in Arizona. We have summer and very summer. Oh wow, interesting. Yeah, so it must right be very now hot. we're in very summer. So <laughs> yeah, I, I think, like we, to trade I think places. We, we have one one type of weather over here called rain. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, now you so you started off as a dentist. So tell us how you went from being a dentist to doing what you're doing today. I think it's an interesting story. Well, uh, in my day, uh, dentists were basically solo practitioners in the United States, and, and I think most of them still are, although some of them have formed group practices where they can share on-call duties and emergency duties uh, uh, for various lifestyle reasons. But um, I've, I started uh, recognizing that a lot of dentists had trouble with devote, uh, developing the kind of spree de core, if you will, the kind of unity and focus on quality dentistry. Mm-hmm. And they were stumbling over a lot of uh, in-office uh, politics and dynamics, uh, even just in a small group of people that will develop. So I had developed a practice management system that solved all of those basic uh, dental practice management issues and Mm -hmm. and very successfully so and I started having other dentists ask me more about hey what do you got going on over your your office why are you so successful how many people did you have in your office we had uh, we had in counting our hygienists we had five people so it's a very small operation but even in a group that small Mm -hmm. there becomes personality clashes and jealousy you know simple human issues so uh, I, I developed a a system and I started teaching it to some of my colleagues that I would, had gone to dental school with and then somebody said yeah you know you need to spread this broad so I developed a two-day seminar called dental practice with peace of mind okay. and another issue that I'd come become aware of is that in the United States in the late 70s early 80s that dentists were leading the uh all other professions in a lot of inauspicious categories depression mm-hmm. Uh, drug abuse, alcoholism, divorce, and so forth. And I really couldn't understand it because we had all this freedom. If we wanted to make a little more money, we could work on Saturdays. We want to cut back. We can do that. We could hire and fire who we wanted. Mm -hmm. And I started recognizing that in the dental profession, uh, there were mindsets, thought processes that weren't very productive. So Mm -hmm. I created this two-day seminar. One day was on practice management, and the next day was on what I called mind management. Okay. And I began to teach it to dentists across the country. Well, amazingly enough, dentists have friends. Yeah. I know that'll shock some of you, but uh, <laughs> they had. Uh, I started getting calls from non-dentists that said, uh, "You know, I've got a good friend who's a dentist. He's been to your seminar, and I don't want the practice management part. I want to uh, know more about your mind management." And that kind of developed slowly, modestly, until one day I received a phone call in my dental office. My receptionist came back and said, Dennis, there's a man from DuPont that wants to talk to you. Mm-hmm. And I, I wasn't too surprised at that because in those days, DuPont was uh, making some dental products and some days manufacturers would have dentists try out some of their products. So mm-hmm. I went to the phone. Gentleman uh, uh, is on the phone. And I'll never forget his name. He says, this is William H. Doan. I'm an executive in the fibers division of DuPont. Back then, that was DuPont. That was by far and away the biggest division. Yeah. He said, I have a very good friend who's raving about your mind management stuff. I think we need it here. I'm going to set up a pilot seminar. I'm going to have upper level management, mid-level managers, rank and file workers. There'll be about 50 people in a room. I want you to come back and teach your message. If it, if it does what it sounds like it can do, we're going to roll it out in the fibers division. So I went back to DuPont, pretty naive, never had spoken to a corporation that size in my life. And I guess I hit a home run because that's what happened. They rolled it out extensively in the fibers division. 
And then it grew from there. Not long after that, we're teaching Motorola. And now I've got kind of this tiger by the tail, not sure really wanting to do what to do with my life here. I, I've worked hard. My wife made sacrifices along with myself to get the dental education. We've got a prosperous, uh, easy road in front of us. And uh, How old were you was, at the time when, when all this started to uh, Let's move. see. How was that? 1986, I was about 38, 39. Okay. Okay. And, um, and yet I, I, and what I was doing at that point is I was teaching, I was doing dentistry two days a week, catching a plane and either going to Phoenix to teach Motorola or to Wilmington, Delaware to teach DuPont, then getting home for the weekend to be a father and involved in my church work and all that kind of thing. And, and I started seeing that really where my dentistry fit into this, it was a preparation for something larger where I could go beyond uh, the people that I could help in a in a simple one man dental office, and I started thinking about making a change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I pictured myself being about ninety nine years old, rocking in a rocking chair on my veranda, uh, thinking if I stayed with dentistry, it would be comfortable and be sure thing. But I can see myself uh, pondering the question: I wonder how far I could have gone with that mind management stuff. And I decided I wasn't going to live with the question. Yeah. And so my wife and I, a uh, little prayer, a little uh, thought on this, we mm -hmm. made the decision to sell the practice and go into corporate education ever since. Uh, and, and Excuse me, corporate education full time. And that's what I've done ever since. Okay, good. So you do seminars in companies and you also do to individuals, right? Well, you know, actually, my, my pie chart these days is I do less and less individual coaching. The vast majority of my work today is, on, is co in corporate education, teaching organizations, really large and small. But we have some very good contracts with some very large companies, uh, world famous names that we do a lot of training for. And uh, I love to be in front of people. I love to con convey the power of these principles and see people uh, eyes light up with the, the aha moments in their life. And so that's what I... I, I do, and I, I love what I do. Yeah, so I see that two two of the core uh, messages, well, three. you got three messages. One is money, your owner's manual, this book that you wrote about money, and because people have a wrong idea about money. And then the other one was ownership and, and the spirit of ownership and then visioneering. So let's talk about these three separately. Let's start off with the money, owner's manual. So why did you write this book about money, and, and what, what, how did you find that this was a problem that some people were having? Well, we actually uh, came about with that message, that book, and a seminar associated with it at, as a specific request from one of our corporate clients. Mm -hmm. We had established a tremendous relationship with Motorola mm -hmm. with what we called our Ownership Spirit Seminar, our Life Management Seminar, and they came to us and said that we have a 401k, we have a retirement program, but none of our people know how to use it effectively. Mm -hmm. We would like you to create a seminar that teaches people sound money principles, good mental processes, and teach them how to uh, go about using, leveraging their 401k and making the most of it. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. We created this uh, course, which really helps people to change their mindset from acquirement mm -hmm. to accumulation. Yeah, and there's a, bit, a difference there. You you can you can if you have an acquirement mindset, mindset you're always out there uh, churning, trying to bring money in the front door. But if it's going out the back door at an equal or greater rate, there's no peace of mind there. There's no success. Yeah, you need to know and, how to multiply. I mean, I remember listening to Jim Rohn many years ago, um, and he was talking about that he had this mentality where if he looked at something in a shop window and he saw the price and he thought to himself, I can't afford it. Um, and um, the, his mentor said to him, he said, you shouldn't be thinking you can't afford it. You should say to yourself, what do I need to do in order to be able to buy it? Well, that, you know, that, and that's a better mindset than uh, I can't afford it. But ultimately, too, one of the, the skills that we, most people struggle with is, if, is really being able to live on less than they make, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And unless and until you can do that, you, you mm -hmm. can create a prodigious income and never have a, a day of financial peace in your mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And so there's, uh, you know, some other aspects of the mental mindset of financial success. And that's what my book's about. 
Good, good. Now let's go into the ownership spirit because this is this is a problem that's that's in many organisations people don't they pass the buck, and and they don't sort of take responsibility for for, for their decisions and stuff like that. So I can see why you developed. But why is why is your ownership spirit different to other courses that are out there? Tell us a bit about it and how you came about figuring this whole ownership spirit course out, the content and that. Tell us a bit about it. Okay. Uh, the, the ownership spirit has really become our main message these days uh -huh. because so much change and challenge, adversity, mergers, acquisitions, restructurings going on in corporate America. It becomes really clear that human beings are really not good at, at change. We, we think we are. We, we say, we, you know, I'm, I'm always open to learning something new, but anything that really uh, upsets our uh, normal day-to-day -day flow our routines and so forth, uh, we don't usually greet them uh, with open arms. And so we really trace this back to the foundations of our mental processes. The first book uh, that I really, that impact in corporate America was the book on mind management, which we really talk about the fact it is an independent, self-governing thinking entity. Uh, we, we choose our thoughts uh, moment by moment. No one can bind our mind, make us think thoughts that we don't want to think or choose attitudes that we don't wish to select. Mm -hmm. And we're really independent in that world. Now, that thinker of thoughts has the ability to think about its thinking right in the process of thinking it. At any moment, I realize that if I realize that what I'm focused on is not constructive or useful or beneficial, I can shift to something that is. And so the ownership spirit is really about helping people to develop the presence of mind to use their presence of mind to recognize that uh, anything dis disruptive, even from a mild irritation to a bone building adversity, our first reaction to that is to go into self protection, to resist it, to resent it, and then, as you pointed out, to blame somebody, make somebody else wrong for it, to point the finger. Yeah. And that works against us in every aspect of life. One of the advantages of actually coming from dentistry, the health professions, into the behavioral sciences and into corporate training is that most of the great research that's happened in the last few years to corroborate what we teach is coming from the medical world. The fact that I can read the medical journals and not be intimidated by the vocabulary and then translate it into everyday language has become one of our key strategic advantages. And it has a really strong impact uh, in corporations, uh, a lot of the engineering and high-tech corporations that are very much uh, uh, interested in science, not pop psychology. And what we're pointing out, we point out early on, is that in as we go into this, this is not the way it should be. I don't like what's happening. Uh, we go into a frame of mind that actually shifts our body chemistry into unproductive uh, processes mm -hmm. uh, that really open our way for uh, some of the widespread health issues that we see, the onset, the growing epidemic of heart attack and stroke and uh, other uh, entities that really have a strong mental component to them. Yeah, stress is a big player in, in all those illnesses you just mentioned. Yeah, and stress, we say, as we're pointing out, is that it's an intellectually manufactured product of the human mind. It's there that it originates. It's there that it's got to be managed and controlled. Yeah. So what kind of suggestions do you have in, in your ownership spirit to be able to, to manage that stress or to minimize Well, the, the first, thing, first thing we like to put across to people is that their first reaction to situations like that is generally not their best option. Yeah. And then to bring it back to that uh, uh, idea that you are an independent self-examining, self-governing entity, and to think about for a moment how you are responding to this, and do you have better options? Uh, and the more we can help people own the situation in that seeing that they, in any situation, uh, have the ability to act on the situation, whereas when we immediately go into what we call victim thinking, it's like everything is acting upon us. Mm -hmm. that outside fiendish forces are, you know, disturbing our, our well-being. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, to, to just give you an example of this uh, in the corporate setting, Alan Mullally just recently retired as the head of Ford. 
-hmm. In my opinion, Alan Mulally has orchestrated one of, excuse me, not one of, it is the greatest corporate turnaround in uh, industrial history. Mm -hmm. And he really drove home the idea that a situation is not good or bad, it is just the way it is, it's mm -hmm. the situation. Then we get to decide what to do about it. And in, in our words, we'd say, we get to decide how to act on it, how we're going to respond to it, and, and to start looking for the various options we might have to deal with the situation effectively. We're not saying that you can immediately find a quick fix, that sometimes things happen that are going to be long-term and with us for a while. But again, it's our approach in the, in the early stages of that that kind of determines the pathway forward and uh, starts building the momentum for having a healthy response that can actually rejuvenate us, to actually improve our immune system and our body's physiology. Let me give you an example of that. Mm -hmm. One of our largest clients is United Launch Alliance. Uh, not many people in the United States have heard of them, may probably not the same as in the UK, but mm -hmm. they're a, uh, uh, a union of Boeing and Lockheed, and they're the people that really are creating the rockets to launch uh, most of the satellites that mm -hmm. uh, you know, are benefiting our life. They have over 90 successful launches, they never had a plan uh, on the pad. Some of the failures you've heard about recently are actually some uh, is a competitive organization that's trying to do what ULA already does so well. Yeah. Now, one the session, one of our sessions, where precious and pressures of work, one of the things on the launch pad that the truth is told, mm -hmm. you either either done it right and it's going to Go, that satellite's going to go where we want it to go, get right in the position we want it to get, or it, it could blow up. This, this person, as she asking her question, she says, there's a tremendous amount of pressure, but there's also a tremendous amount of excitement. Most of us live for launch day. Yeah. It's the most exciting part of our career. Is that unhealthy for us, that pressure, that stress? Yeah. And my answer to her was, no, there's two types of stress. There's eustress, E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S, -E -S -S, and there's distress. If pressure is something that you are uncomfortable with, uh, you fight it, you fear it, that is very unhealthy. But if it turns on the creative juices, if it turns on the adrenaline, you get excited about it, um, then it is actually therapeutic. It enhances the quality of your life. Uh, enhances the physiology of your body and uh, literally is is for your good. I do not know a good UK analogy here. I, in a certain way, I call and sometimes I call it John Elway mentality. He okay. was a famous quarterback in American football for the Denver Broncos. Yeah. He loved when his team was down five points and he had the football with a minute and a half left. He would drive down and win the game time after time. He thrived in those situations. Yeah. So that that's you stress. Good results. But again you understand that you stress or dress stress are mental constructs. Yeah. We decide how to look at that uh, challenge. We decide how to look at that pressure packed moment. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is that, that that mental dialogue that goes on in your head and the questions you ask yourself when situations happen. Um, I always when, when things don't go as I want them to go, I always ask myself the question. In fact, I gave a talk in, in church on Sunday about this. And I said, you know, when things go wrong, you can either complain about it and moan about it. Or you can say to yourself, wait a minute, what have I learned? Because I guarantee you in every situation in your life, there will be something that you can learn from it. And so if you've learned something from a bad situation or from a situation that didn't go as you, as you had planned, uh, you take that positive and take it with you into the future. And so exactly. it's that internal dialogue. And, you know, with professional golfers, they always say that if you take the top 100 golfers in the world, technically, they're, they're almost all the same. But what distinguishes number one from number 100 is, is up here. It's it's the mind, and I think it was Jack totally Nicklaus. Agree. Jack Nicklaus that said, "I play I play the game up here first before I play it actually physically." Um, and exactly. Yeah, and so it's it's always a, a mind game all the time, and I think the mind game is the questions that we ask ourselves. And for example, when I did my command course to become a captain on the Boeing seven thirty seven, 
the my, my instructor said to me, he said, one of the main reasons aircraft accidents happen is because the pilots do not gather enough information or all the information before they make the decision. And sometimes that means asking the other guy a question or the, the, the chief flight attendant a question to get the answer because there have been some accidents where the two pilots are so busy and they forget to ask the, 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 the flight attendant or the flight attendant forgot to give them some information. Ice was create, got built up on the wing. The airplane stalled and crashed in, 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 into the mountain. So gathering all the information, communicating and then making the decision. Again, how do you gather information? You ask questions. You ask questions to yourself and you ask questions to the other people and then you listen to the answers and that's how you gather all the information before you make your decision. Absolutely. Those are, those are specific ownership, mind management skills that, that everybody needs to learn and apply. Yeah, and I, and I would say every aircraft accident where, where the human factor has been the main reason, they didn't gather enough information. It's, it's always the case. Now, let's look at visioneering. Tell us a bit about visioneering because it's, 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 it's an interesting word, vision, visioneering. Well, uh, human beings are motivated by the pictures in their heads. Most of us don't really realize that. We don't realize how specific and powerful they are. But they really are the roadmap that we follow continually in small, everyday uh, routine matters to creating in our heads uh, sensory rich, emotion laden goals that can really again turn on our creative uh, efforts, our uh, ignite our uh, the synergy between our conscious mind and our such subconscious mind to come up with breakthrough ideas and extraordinary performance. So once we establish the basis that and and get people to really buy in that the single biggest determinant in what's happening to them is what they're causing to happen in their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. And to get them to own that, to take ownership for it, then the next layer is to see how they can use more strategically uh, this ability we have to create uh, visions of the future in our head, to run mm -hmm. mental movies. Mm -hmm. uh, we did it as children. We had this well-developed sensory imaginary capacity that we had as we came in to uh, put ourselves in all sorts of scenarios and we had to act them out. We do it later on in adulthood, but it's in an unproductive format. We don't call it visioneering. Mm -hmm. We call it worrying. Yeah. But if you stop and analyze what worrying is, you're running sensory rich, emotion laden, mental movies in your head. You put yourself right into the, to the moment. You put yourself in, in so realistically that it actually changes again the physiology in your body. Mm -hmm. You're tossing it in your bed tying the sheets in a knot in your stomach as well all very unproductively with that very same capacity you could be engineering where you want to go in the next six months where you want to be in five years that kind of thing yeah. and then it'll really create that into a movie that you repeat with some regularity you'll start getting ideas coming into your mind spontaneously uh, sometimes as you wake up in the morning mm -hmm. sometimes Get, or awaken in the middle of the night with something on your mind. If you jot it down, you often will have something very valuable to work on. And so that process that results in what we call power goaling is also another uh, category of corporate training that we, we present. And, and it's that, that uh, visioneering message is outlined uh, quite clearly in the book on mind management. So do you, do you encourage people to create vision boards? You know, there's this thing about... Yes. Vision. Yeah. Yes, but, but those are those vision boards are really just a, a, a daily or a, a, a spontaneous reminder. The most important vision is the one you run in their head. And yeah. I, I really recommend that you find a place in your home where you have privacy, put mm -hmm. on some uh, um, uh, music, some music that kind of at first soothes you and then yeah. builds and crescendos to something uh, much more yeah. exciting. Yeah. Uh, soundtrack of a lot of your... Uh, uh, popular movies have, yeah. have elements in it like that. Yeah. And then you really close your eyes and run the picture of you achieving that goal as though it's happening to you presently. Yes. And then you flow into the benefits that will go to you. That's your vision board. Yeah. But actually live those in your, in your brain. And then what happens is the subconscious will start to take over and start delivering to you plans and hunches and ideas to start moving in the direction of fulfilling them. Yeah, I do this with my my oldest son has, has played uh, played for the U, for England in the uh, World Golf Championships, 
And one of the things I did with him, uh, acting a bit as his mental coach, is I said, "Okay, Benjamin, uh, what I need you to do when you when you when your ball gets onto the green, I need you to visualize the ball going into the hole before it does. So close your eyes, take a deep breath, and actually see the ball go into the hole." And he was at one competition, and and it was like, I'd say it was probably twenty five feet away from the hole. And he, he was right on the edge of the green and it was a choice. Do I chip it or do I putt it from there? So he gets the putter out of the bag. I said, you sure you can do this? He said, yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll visualize it. And he, he, did his, he did his visualizing and whatever and it went straight in. And the umpire that was there was shocked. He thought, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, but the, but the, this visualization, and I, and I learned this from reading the biography of, of Greg Norman, who was one of the top golfers a few years ago. He used to do this breathing exercise and this visualization before he actually putted. And, um, and I must say, I know he doesn't always get it straight in, but, um, but most of the time it, it really, really does help. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that, that, that is a, is a great one. Now, what's your view of the law of attraction? Cause we have over the years with the movie, the secret and that heard a lot about this law of attraction and a lot of people have come on written books about it and done seminars and, and there's a lot of hype about it. Um, and a lot of people say, well, you can't just sit there and think positive and then, and then things happen. Uh, what, what's your view of the law of attraction? Well, I think there certainly is a law of attraction. Mm -hmm. I do agree with some people that the books that talk about it don't go far enough to complete the entire journey. Exactly. And, I agree. And, and, I agree. Okay. So let me just say, people will, uh, have said in our seminars, you know, all this mental stuff is well and fine, but doesn't it come down to hard work? And my answer to them is, of course, yeah. it is absolutely necessary that you act upon, implement learn as you already mentioned when you have a uh, you fall short you have a setback something doesn't work you learn from it and re regroup and go forward yeah. but who are the people that are willing to pay the price and actually do that yeah they are the people who have in their head a vision that is so so compelling that they're willing to pay that price and so it's that still comes back to mind management the people who uh, uh, give up early on the people who run into the first adversity and bail out they're not your high achievers they're not the, the people we look up to and respect so as you are in the process of visualizing you are sending out into the universe uh, via quests and I believe these ideas that come into our head they come from divine sources and they can come from sources other than that as well that uh, bring about these quote-unquote coincidences that are not coincidental. So you, you do, I think, attract according to what you're projecting. But then those come, uh, those coincidences have to be acted upon. They have to be implemented. They have to be completed. And that's where having a goal that you continue in, when you wake up in the morning, it's on your mind. As you're drifting out of sleep, it's on your mind. You have the energy and the will to continue to persist and achieve it. Yeah. So in absence of a century rich goal in your head I don't think there are too many high achievers uh, and it's but the law of attraction is that you just think it and it comes to you automatically is only partial truth it the opportunities will come ideas to act will come but you, then you've got to enact them yeah but you also have to want it I mean I when, when I in fact when you and I met we were, we were holding these seminars for y the youth in our church and the exercise I was doing with them was they had to break through a piece of wood. And what they would what they would do is they would write on the wood all their fears. And then they had to come up with a goal and they had to come up with a strong reason why they wanted to achieve that goal. And then they need to visualize uh, them achieving the goal and living the goal. OK, yeah. now, interestingly enough, usually when you have like 100 people in the room, you get about 10 that can't break through the piece of wood. OK, and it's not the 90 that do it first time round. That, that's a big achievement. The big achievement lies in taking the 10 that didn't do it first time round and helping them. And recently we were in Sweden at a, a church conference, my wife and I, and we, we taught this again. And uh, one girl, she tried, I'm not joking, Dennis, 65 times until she broke <laughs> wow. through the piece of wood. And the problem was she was giving too much energy to her fears and she didn't have a big enough goal. And I said, you've got to have it. So what's your goal? She said, I want to have a happy marriage. Okay. Now, what I really need you to do here is I need you to sit down for 10 minutes and imagine your life with your husband. This was a young girl. She was 
16 years old. I said, imagine yourself in 10 years time or 20 years time with, with, with your husband, your family and everything. And I, and I kept asking her questions and questions and questions to help her to visualize, but more than visualize, to feel that goal. And then once we got that emotion level up to where it needed to be, she broke through. That's visionary. Yeah. So, so you just described it. Yeah. Having that passion. And, and as Napoleon Hill said in his famous book, Think and Grow Rich, it's all down to being passionate about something. Because if the passion's not in the goal, it's not going to happen. Well, and that's where you, you mentioned something you went by so qu quickly. I'd like to go back and highlight it. Yeah. You've got to have a higher purpose to it. I think something even beyond a personal goal. I don't think you'd be powerful in goaling unless your goal has something that really is important to you, a, a current reward on a personal level. But working for our own selfish grandizement is, uh, is also leaves a lot of power on the table. Being able to put that in the context of this is going to make a contribution to another person, mm -hmm. a, a group, your client, uh, humanity in general is very important. Mm -hmm. And when you can couple those two factors, something that means something to you personally, a reward that you desire with a great deal of passion, and it, uh, it, it contributes to the greater good, a higher purpose, now you are full-fledged power goaling. Yeah, power goal, and that's an that's a interesting term. Yeah, okay. Uh, what projects are you working on right now? Could you tell us a bit about what 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 you've got on the go now, and what you're going to be working on in the future? Before well, we... well, thank you. It was one of a, as I have uh, mentioned to you earlier, mm -hmm. a, a number of very Im, Im, uh, large companies use our training, and they don't always use myself or uh, other Cuma trainers. They they want their own. Uh, employees to be able to be certified to teach our material and right now I'm in the process of revising our what we call our train the trainer facilitator manual mm -hmm. uh, to update the ownership spirit as you create a course and you teach others to teach it that way uh, within a, six months or a year you keep evolving and finding better ways of saying what you want to say and new and stronger pieces of evidence to support it and so periodically we update that material to make sure that it's cutting edge and it's related to current and relevant issues and supported by the best research out there. So I'm really in the, uh, up to my shoulders in really revising the ownership spirit train the trainer manual right now mm -hmm. and very excited about this uh, 2016 vintage that we'll be bringing out uh, uh, the first of the year. Okay, great, great. So how can people contact you Dennis and find out more about your work our website is cuma.net it's q u m a dot net okay. www.cuma.net uh, that's the the best way to get a hold of us another thing we all, uh, offer is and some of your uh, listeners might be very much in in a family mode wanting these principles to get to their young people we also have created in 2015 here a teen empowerment course we called Own It. Oh, nice. And if you have a, a young person, yeah. uh, 14 to 20, that you would like them to have these kind of skills that we're teaching, they want to go, they, you want them to enroll them in Own It. Mm -hmm. It's the website is Own It U. It's O-W-N-I-T-U like in university. Okay. Ownitu.com. Oh, okay. And if and I'll give them a code where they can get a substantial discount. If they'll go on and register there, when it comes to for the payment, it retails for eighty nine. If they'll type in the coupon code, Teen Success, all caps, mm -hmm. Teen Success, all caps. Yep. That will give them a substantial discount, and uh, it's a, a very engaging, um, very positive. A fun course for young people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's video saturated. They don't just watch videos. They interact with the videos. It's kind of mm -hmm. like choose your own adventure. Yep. At the end, they have earned 10 badges that gets a certificate, a credential mm -hmm. they can use for applying for jobs mm -hmm. or for entrance into college. Okay, that's great. That's great that you're doing stuff for young people because I think young people need this kind of stuff today. Uh, what's your view on young people? And apart from this course that you've developed, um, well, well, I, I believe that my concern, I believe, first of all, that th this is an extremely bright, gifted generation. Yes, I agree. But they're I a bit believe lost. That they're going but they are a bit I lost. I believe they're going to be facing some very 
significant challenges in the future. World dynamics are d dictating that. And this is why I put, I put a lot of resources, a fair amount of capital, to say the least, yeah. and time into this Own It course. Yeah. Because I believe that most of us, in, as parents, have done our children a disservice in that we've not let them uh, exercise their problem-solving skills enough. We, we fight their battles for them. We see a problem, we, we throw money at it. We, mm. we have got to help our young people be better at being uh, more responsible, better problem solvers, better able to have the confidence that they can tackle a large goal or achieve uh, a significant outcome. I think that we have made life a little bit too easy for yeah, them. Don't you, think, and, don't you think that this is caused by the school? I mean, I, I'm a bit of a, not a rebel, but uh, my children do not go to school. I've got four children. My oldest is 14, the youngest is seven. Uh, none of them have ever been to school. We homeschool them, okay? And the reason being that I don't think in school they teach children to think. They just teach them to memorize all these dates and things that happened in history and geography. And, where, and they don't teach you basically to think. And I think the ability to think and to be creative are two very important things that will determine whether you're going to be successful in life or not. And I think, unfortunately, the schooling system in the Western world has taken that away from kids and just churns out kids with high grades that don't really know how to think. And I think this is the main problem. Well, I think there's a lot of people in corporate America that would agree with you. I, I, uh, Cuma learning probably would not exist if in the home and especially the school systems we were turning out more change-able, resilient, resourceful, yeah, exactly. problem-solving people. Exactly. Uh, I, I, there are some efforts between industry and education to amend that, at least going on in the United States. Uh, they look promising. Hopefully they will be more successful, but we, we, a lot of employers have to spend time building skills in people that they really ought to have coming into the workforce. Yeah, but if you, I mean, a few months ago, they published the top countries in the world with the best education system, and number one was Singapore. And the United States is in 26th position, the UK is number 20. Interestingly, you've got countries like Canada, number 10, but the top five nations were all from the Far East. Yeah. Um, and the kids out there, they taught to think. They put a lot of emphasis on maths and science and whatever and, and, and on thinking. And, and so if you fast forward that 10, 15 years, we can see where the economy is going. So that is probably why something like homeschooling is, is, I mean, more and more kids here in the UK every year. I mean, I just see it here in, in our local community here in, in, in Shirley, in Lancashire, in the, just near, the, the, near Manchester. Uh, when we started homeschooling, we were like one of the very few families that homeschooled. Now we've got like, I don't know, 20, 30 different families homeschooling, even in, in our church. Um, and uh, there's so many now just taking their kids out of school and homeschooling. It's got a lot easier now with online stuff, in online resources for homeschoolers. So it's a lot easier today than it was 14, 15 years ago. Um, but I think the main thing and, and the main thing we can teach our children is self-reliance. And the self-reliance comes through teaching them to how to think. And if they've got yeah. those thinking skills and that, that creativity, that will give them confidence. And, and that's what they need, really. To move forward. Yeah, I agree with you. And to confirm exactly what you're saying, uh, a large sector of the people that have signed their children up for Own It are homeschoolers, people that there you go. get yeah. understand exactly what you're saying. And they use this as a tool in their homeschooling to help build those kind of character traits in their yeah. young people. That's great. Great. Dennis, thank you very much for being on the show. And uh, My pleasure. And uh, when I'm in Arizona next, let's go for lunch. I will, I will be happy to take you to the finest place I can take you. Okay. I, I, I hope you'll take me up on that. Thank okay. you so much. Okay. Thank you.